So far when we've talked about evaluating forecasts, we've talked about having a training set and a test set. We're now going to get a little bit more sophisticated about how we construct those. So here's the traditional setup. We have the training set in blue and the test set in orange. We fit a model to the blue data and we forecast the, the periods corresponding to the orange dots. And then we compare them against what actually happened then. Now in time series cross-validation, we actually set up lots of training sets and lots of test sets by subdividing the data at different points. So for example, we could have these observations as our training set and this observation as our test set. And then the next time around, we could add that observation into our training set to make it one period longer and forecast the next observation. And we continually do that so that the training sets grow longer, one observation at a time, and we can see how well our model's doing on the observations one step ahead. We can do the same thing for looking at different forecast horizons. Here is the same training sets, but looking at two steps ahead, or we could look at three steps ahead, or four steps ahead, and so on. So this is called time series cross-validation, uh, sometimes also known as evaluation on a rolling forecast origin, because the origin, which is the point at which you're jumping off, the end of the training set, that's rolling forward through the data set. The forecast accuracy is then averaged over all of the test sets and we get an idea how good the model is. And this is much better than just a single split because with a single split you've only got one observation for each of the forecast horizons. Whereas when we do it this way we have lots of observations for each of the forecast horizons so we get a much better idea how good the model is at each horizon. Now to do this in the Fable package there is a nice little function called stretch Sybil. Um, so we take our data set and we stretch underscore Sybil and then the first argument is how many observations form our initial training set. So in my example over here I had these eight observations forming the initial training set. Um, you need enough observations to be able to fit a model um, but you don't want to have too many observations because you need to have the replications as we in this direction as we increase the size of the training set. So in my little example here, because it's a very simple model, um, I'm choosing an initial training set of size 3. And then the step argument is how big you increase the training set each time. So in both the graphical example I showed earlier and in this code, we're increasing it one observation at a time. But for computational reasons, you might make it a bigger number so you have fewer training test set splits, but you'll get through it faster. Um, and of course, the last training test set split will have all of the data as training data, and then there won't be an observation to test at the end. So I remove the last one. Now, you'll see that this has created a extra column in my data set. So the first three columns uh, exactly as they were before. My new column is called the ID, which is, corresponds to which row of, of this graphic we're in. So this would be ID 1, this would be ID 2, and so on. So you can see for ID 1, I've got three observations, the first three. For ID 2, I've got the same first three observations plus an extra one, the fourth observation. So my second training set is four periods long, and so on, all the way through. So you get a lot of repetition here, um, and we have 1,255 different splits um, of the training data and what follows the test data. Okay, then we can take that um, Sybil, the stretched Facebook data, pipe it into a model in exactly the way you do any other Sybil, and you'll notice, actually, that this is just a standard Sybil. It just has an extra key, which tells you which of these splits you're doing. Otherwise, everything after that is exactly as you would expect. So you pipe it into the model. We say, let's fit a random walk with drift. Um, and it comes back with one observation for every unit combination of keys. In this case, 
there's just a single key which has 1255 unique values and so we have 1255 rows in our Mabel, um, each corresponding to one of those models. And then I can pipe that into forecast in the usual way and I'll get a, uh, a forecast for each of the periods in the data. I'm only going one step ahead, so I'm only going to talk about, I'm only going to try to forecast one observation ahead. So I have one forecast for every um, possible test split that I constructed. And then I can pipe that into accuracy to see how good my model was at doing one step forecasts. Um, so if I do that, I get this row here, which says that my root mean squared error um, doing this one step at a time um, is 2.418. Just as a comparison, here is what you would get if you didn't, uh, if you just used the all of the data um, to fit the drift parameter, and then computed in sample. So it's not really a fair comparison because this is using known data, and so it's slightly better because it knows how to estimate the drift across the entire data set. Um, so that's just for comparison to show how much, in this case, what. Um, benefit there is in knowing the future when you're producing the forecasts. Uh, so this is a good general tool for deciding what a good model is. Um, you construct lots of training test splits using time series cross validation and then you find the model with the smallest root mean squared error. And uh, in general uh, that will give you a good model for future forecasting data that you haven't yet seen.